is Chris Chris Kreitcho. Yes. Um, and <laughs> he um, is going to be giving us giving the talk. Um, Tole Lege designing readable Bibles with digital typography. Yes. Thank you. So as she said, I'm getting clapped at already. Uh, I'm Chris Kreitcho. I'm currently a student at Southeastern Baptist Seminary out in Wake Forest, and I am also a full-ish time software developer. It's kind of hard to be full-time and do seminary full-time, but I do as much as I can. Over the last nine months or so, I've been building, rebuilding HolyBible.com from the ground up for Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, and what we've done there is built a brand new way of reading the King James Bible online similar to what you might see at ESV Online or one of those. And so what we're going to talk about today is sort of a compliment for any of you who were here and heard Mark's talk in the last session. Mark told you why readability is important, and I'll just summarize that for any of you who weren't in here. <coughs> Typography gives meaning to text. Now, it's not the only thing that does so, but it shapes how you understand a text. And beyond that, typography is one of the essential elements in making a text readable. Now, a story to illustrate a little bit. Tole lege is a phrase that means take up and read. Why have I titled my talk? Yes, the allow button. Yes, Firefox, I do want to allow that. Yay! Now you can see. Now you can read. Uh, why have I chosen this talk, this title to summarize my talk? Let me tell you a story. It's about a young man who grew up with a Christian mother who wanted him to walk with God and struggled with it and went off and had his sexual libertine days and eventually came back around to the church and was wrestling with these questions of faith. Met with his pastor regularly, listened to a lot of sermons. Eventually, one day, he was standing around outside and heard a bunch of children singing a children's song. Tole lege, tole lege. Tole lege is Latin for take up and read. And it something pricked him. I would say the Holy Spirit pricked him. And he picked up a Bible that was nearby and he started reading. You may have heard of him. His name is St. Augustine. He was able to pick up a Bible and read it. And that was when his conversion actually happened. He had many years of struggle. But it was the experience of taking up and reading a Bible that day where his conversion happened. And that was quite literally a conversion that has shaped the history of the world since, because Augustine's thought has been so influential, both directly within Christian thought, but also more broadly in thought around. How we read the Bible matters, and our ability to read the Bible matters. And typography is one of the most essential tools for reading a text. Typography and typesetting which is the art of displaying a given text with type. This is how we display a text, and that matters for reading. Now, this includes fonts, but it also includes a lot of other things, and we're mostly today actually going to talk about those other things. So we are going to spend a little time on typefaces, fonts, at the end. Readability is our ultimate goal with the Bible. There are a lot of other things we do with the Bible. We study, we tease apart connections between different passages, we do detailed analysis on how the lexical relationships occur, and we translate it, and we do all these things. But the ultimate goal of all of those, in many ways, is to read and understand the words. <laughs> Typography is one of the best tools in our toolbox for reading and understanding clearly. So we have a few essential questions about the typographical decisions we make. One, can you read individual words clearly? If you can't do that, you're hosed. You can't read a text if you can't read individual words clearly. Two, can your eye flow through a line easily? Can you get from word to word? Because again, if you can't go word to word to word and you're constantly stopping and blocking, your ability to comprehend the text just drops very rapidly. Three, can your eye flow from line to line? Or is it that when you get to the end of one line, you're struggling and trying to find the next line? Again, then you start thinking about the act of reading rather than about what it is that you are reading. Four, does the form of the text 
match the content of the text. And this matters because, well, we've all seen, I'm sure, a fair share of things set in Comic Sans or Papyrus. If I set the text of the Bible in Comic Sans, that conveys something to you. It conveys a lack of seriousness. It conveys a certain silly joviality to it. And the Bible is many things, but it's not a silly, unserious kind of book. We we want to convey what the kind of material we're doing is. If you're putting together a birthday party announcement for your four-year-old, Comic Sans is a perfectly fine choice. If you're setting the text of the Bible and you do that, I may be tempted to punch you. I probably won't. Grace of God in my life and all that. But I'll be tempted. <laughs> so what are the tools? Obviously, we can talk all day about why we should do this. But how do we do it? And basically, we have a series of tools at our disposal that I'm going to talk about today. One of them is layout. Now, I have here page layout because I'm talking about digital typesetting. A lot of what I'm going to say is applicable to non-digital context, but I want to apply it specifically to the digital world. There's no such thing as a page in the digital world. There are sort of marginless spaces that we constrain in certain ways. But nonetheless, the way we lay those out matters, and we can draw on lessons from hundreds of years of typesetting and thousands of years of writing of presenting the text to do that in a way that works well. Next, hierarchy and rhythm. This, both of these first two really go to the issue of flowing through the text. The way that the layout on the quote unquote page works, and then how you demonstrate hierarchy between components of the text, and how those texts are set with rhythm. Is there a, a sense of vertical rhythm and horizontal rhythm on the page, or does it feel haphazard as you're moving through it? Both of those things are essential elements in letting your eyes flow down through it. And then finally, the choice of typeface, which that really helps us both with reading words and the form matching the content. If you pick a bad font where you can't read the words, you're in trouble. And again, if you set the Bible in Comic Sans, we're going to have angry, grumpy words. So pure bang for your buck of all of these, it turns out that layout is actually where it's at. Now, that might surprise you in a talk about typography that I'm not saying that fonts are the number one thing. But I actually think that the way you lay out the text is at least as important as the typeface you choose. Layout in this case means basically three things. The size of the text, the length of every line of text, and the what we might call line height. Historically, it was called letting. It's the distance between lines. But we should be clear, it's not just those things individually. It's the relationship between those things that makes text readable or not readable. So text size. Few simple goals with this that are pretty easy to keep in mind. It has to be big enough to read. How many of you here have ever visited a website with 10-point Arial as the typeface selection? How easy was that to read? Not very. <laughs> yeah, it's impossible. You, as, and the older your eyes get, the harder that gets. It, you just can't read it. So it has to be large enough to read. On the other hand, I have been to websites in some of the modern design trends where the type was massive. You get through like a paragraph on your, you know, your 27 inch monitor and you're like, I'd like to read more than that. That's why I have a big monitor. You want the text to be small enough to read a lot, relatively speaking. So you're basically balancing these two against each other. You want it to be large enough to read, but small enough to get a lot of text in the page, just not too small. And this is going to be our refrain throughout a lot of the rest of the section. There are no hard and fast rules when you're dealing with typesetting. There are some guidelines. But they really are more like guidelines than actual rules, if you'll pardon a mid-2000s Pirates movie reference. And also the typeface that you choose does matter, even in these layout issues. And I'll explain why in a little bit. So of these, line length. Basic rule of thumb. You want somewhere roughly between 48 and 78 characters on a line. Sometimes people will say 50 to 72. Sometimes people will say 45 to 68. Somewhere in that ballpark is roughly what you want. 
You'll also hear 10 to 12 words per line. That's kind of a minimum. If you get over about 20 words per line, you're probably going to have problems. And I'll show you why in just a second. But, but first, a quick note. I'm talking very specifically about English here. When you open up, say, the Greek text or a German text or other things, these rules are going to change, especially the, the words per line change. Greek words tend to be a lot longer than English words. German words tend to be a lot longer than English words. Your lump, your numbers there are going to vary more, but some of the issues in terms of characters per line are going to be relatively constant with Western characters. Now you start talking Chinese, the rules are different, but the idea is still the same. You still need to balance the length of a line against the size of the line so that it's readable. Again, it's no hard and fast rule, and I'll show you a little later an example of two typefaces where you might need to set this very differently. But why might this matter? Okay, so here's what it looks like kind of right in the middle of that range. You can see you're reading along, I've given it a decent line height, which we'll talk, in, talk about in a moment. You're reading along, and it's pretty easy to jump line to line now. You can track what each line says, but it's not hard as you get to the end of one line to jump to the next line. You've got enough text that you can get a flow moving horizontally through it, but you don't have so much that it becomes difficult to read. Whereas here, that line starts to get long. It's hard to get from the end of this line, the first line to the beginning of the second, and make sure that you're getting to the right line. On the other hand, we've also seen the experience on a very narrow phone. I'll have a visual for this in a minute where you've got a whole whopping four words on a line because the, the font was just set too large and it's really hard to read anything because you're just constantly jumping lines. So we want to avoid either of those extremes. And that 45 to 75 characters rule is one that's been established for a long time in books because over decades and then centuries of experimentation in physical copy, typesetters, starting with Gutenberg, worked to figure out where where does the human eye respond well naturally and this is what we figured out so it's a data driven thing it's not purely because of aesthetics but it's how do i read this well that's how now line height this is really the space between lines again historically it was called leading most of the time in modern parlance, you'll hear line height. That's the rule that you use in CSS, for example, if you're doing web development to set it. And here, basically, you want it to be 1.5 times the size of the text. So if your text is 12 point text, in CSS, you can just say, I want the line height to be 1.5. You can do the same thing in most uh, layout programs, even including something as relatively unsophisticated for typography as Microsoft Word. And what that will do is it will say, okay, if I have 16 point text, for example, the distance between each line is going to be half of that again. So eight points between each line. And roughly around there, anywhere from 1.4 to 1.6 tends to work well. You have to adjust this for wider lines. You actually have to increase it if the lines are wider and you have to decrease it if lines are narrower. And I'll show you why. The short version is it has to do with that issue of your, your eye jumping from line to line. And that is one of the biggest things in getting into a flow when you're reading is can you move line by line by line without getting that hiccup of trying to figure out which line you're on. So again, there's no hard and fast rule. These are guidelines. Roughly one and a half for normal text layout tends to be good. So here's what it looks like at one and a half. This is kind of your normal narrow view on that and you can see it works okay but it, it looks actually kind of like a lot of space between the lines and this isn't super narrow but it's narrow enough that you don't get a lot of text on each line this is a more normal width and you can see here this is actually the same example i gave earlier it's easy just to move line by line by line down through this and this is fairly similar to what you'll see glad to say in most good Bible apps and so forth as the default. Not all, but most. And it's gotten much better in the last couple of years. And here again, we're back at that example with the long lines. We've all read or seen manuals for technical things online where it's even worse than this, where it's just the full width of the page and good luck reading it. Any readers of Linux or Git man pages know exactly what I'm talking about. So. What if we drop the line height? This is, this is about 
you can see here's a slightly narrower view. This is comparable to what you might see in uh, a phone context, you know, if you've got it open on your Android or iPhone. You can see that dropping the line height is actually helpful when your lines are narrower. It lets your eye continue to move, but you get more text on the page. And because the lines are a little bit shorter, it's not a problem here. This is that normal width again. This is the 66-ish characters. And you can see that it gets a little harder to make that jump line by line here, just by dropping the line height a little bit. And wait for it. Ugh. <laughs> Good luck getting your eyes to track on that. That's about 100 characters of text set at roughly that 1.2 value, and it's just really hard to read. Now, what if we go the other direction? What if we increase the line height outside of that median area? Well, we've also seen this on our iPhones or Androids. Good luck reading anything because you're, I mean, scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and your thumb is getting tired by the time your pastor gets through a sermon because good grief, you've scrolled. And he only read six verses. It works okay here, kind of in that normal width. It's not bad, but again, you just have a lot of extra glut of space and it just decreases the amount you can read, but you're not getting any gain from that. On the other hand, if you do have a reason why you need to set text wide, if you need to be out in that 100 characters range, increasing the line width or the line height there lets it be a little easier. Your eye can track to what the next line is. So if you have to do that for some reason, uh, if you have a reason why you have to set full width text and you can't increase the, the text size, bump up the line height to compensate. That's an out. It's not the best thing in the world to do, but it gives you an out. Now, as you probably picked up as I was talking through that, there's this interplay between the line height and the line length, and there's also an interplay with the typeface you've chosen. Different typefaces require different relationships. Let me give you an example. Here are two fonts, both of which I quite like. One of them, they don't look great on the screen because it's very high resolution, but on most modern devices with good resolutions, these both look very good. But you can see the characteristics of the two fonts are really different. Century is wide. Dito is pretty narrow. The strokes on Century are thick. The strokes on Dito range quite a bit, but they tend to be thin. You're going to have to pick different widths and different relationships. I should also note, the height of the lowercase letters to the uppercase letters is different between the two of them. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to typefaces. But those things make a difference in the readability. With something like Dito, you actually are going to have to increase the space between the lines a little bit because of the X height there. It's harder to track line to line when those lowercase and uppercase letters are proportioned that way than with something like Century. So what this should suggest to you is that this is an art. There aren't hard, again, <laughs> there just aren't hard and fast rules. But if you play with these guidelines in mind, whether you're displaying the text in logos or whether you're displaying the text on your own web application or whatever the context may be, or for that matter, if you're printing a physical Bible, putting these things into play and recognizing that you have to be mindful of each of them and how they play off of each other lets you do it well in a way that's readable. Toolbox item number two. So the first one was our most important. This one is a close second. It probably ties with typeface. Hierarchy and rhythm. What do we mean by this? Basically, we mean the ability to do, answer the question, what's what on the page? What's a heading? What's body text? What is something else entirely, like chapter and verse numbers? What is something that's related to the text, like footnotes, but that isn't actually part of the text? And how do all of those pieces relate to each other? And the, the big message to take away in this section is that difference draws attention. So when you change things, you're going to draw the reader's attention. That can be good, that can be bad, the biggest thing to understand is that because difference draws attention, you can use that to draw attention or to avoid drawing attention as you want to, as supports the readability of the text. Now, why does this matter? Why do we need to be able to set off those kinds of differences? Let me tell you a story about a Hebrew textbook I've used in my time at Southeastern Seminary, and which, given what I'm about to tell you, I'm very grateful to say that the professor stopped using the year after we used it. This text 
had usually up to about four levels of heading and then body text. It was set in 12 point times New Roman double spaced everything. And even though it would have four levels of heading, they were all just Times New Roman 12 point bold. So you couldn't actually tell just by looking at the text whether this was a subsection or a new top level section or any of that. All you could tell was that there was some kind of break happening because it was bold. But it made it very much more difficult for everybody to hold in their head how the pieces of the author's explanation of Hebrew fit together. And if anybody here is a native English speaker who then has tried to learn Hebrew, you'll understand that knowing how an author's explanation fits together is useful because Hebrew is hard. Uh, Hebrew is not particularly like English. The letters read the other direction, etc. The last thing you need is a text where you can't figure out how the pieces fit together because you're having a hard enough time figuring out how the letters fit together. We don't normally have exactly that problem when we're dealing with a Bible, but we can introduce confusion if we're not careful about the way things relate to each other, even just down to the level that if we don't use that difference effectively, we can make things look more important than they are, or we can confuse what is text and what is supplementary material. So what are the tools for this? The first one and the simplest is weight, style, or ornamentation. Then again, you have typeface. And finally, you have white space and position. Now I say finally, even though there's one more thing on my board, and I'll explain why when we get to color at the end. Those first three are the big ones. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't clear enough for Siri. <laughs> Weight, style, and ornamentation. This is very simple. Bold, italic, and then different kinds of ornamentation, whether that's underlining, whether that's providing the kinds of marks you'll often see associated with footnotes or paragraphing or section breaks, which are what those various are. Those are your basic tools for using weight, style, and ornamentation. And you can use any of those, and you can use them together. Using those lets you mark things off as more important, or here's a break in the text, etc. If any of you were here in Mark's talk previously, you'll note that he talked about verse numbers and then paragraphs being marked just with the pilcro, that paragraph marker there. That is a way of marking divisions in text and so on. And it can be an effective one if used thoughtfully and carefully. I think bold and italic tend to read more clearly than the markers do to English readers in the current day. That's not necessarily true in other languages or other contexts, though. So context matters there. Now, typeface is sort of the unifying element here. But it can also be a dividing element in that changing the typeface draws someone's attention. And there are good and bad ways to put this to use. The good way to put this to use is that you can use that difference and distinction to distinguish things that should be distinguished. Headers that are external to the text of the Bible, you want to be distinguished. This is why in most printed Bibles you will find the body text is usually set in a serif font, uh, the little horns or hooks on the ends of all the characters, and the headings are normally set in a sans font. And we'll talk about why that decision was made later, but the distinction between the two helps you separate the two in your mind. You can see that, oh, this is a heading. It's not the same thing as the rest of that text. It also lets you distinguish notes from Scripture. So, again, if you look at most study Bibles that are printed, you'll find that the notes are written in a different typeface than the body text. And that's really important because it helps you see, this is the Bible. This is someone else's commentary on the Bible. And that lets you understand the relationship between the two. And keeping that relationship clear is important for reading. It's very important for reading. Uh, what about white space? So the horizontal and vertical relationships between the elements on a page can also influence those sense of relationship. If you spread things out vertically more than they do otherwise, you can make it really clear that there's a, there's a gap here. That's one of the common ways to mark paragraphing, and especially on the web, that's a very common way to mark paragraphing, is to set, just separate things visually rather than trying to indent them. But indentation is also a form of spacing and alignment. It's using a shift in the horizontal relationship between elements to indicate a relationship between the content of those elements. Likewise, you can do it with headers that get dragged out to the side. So you've got a nice smooth line running around, and then all of a sudden a header sticking out to the side of it marks it off as something new. 
or a centered element. So the relationship in the interplay between elements can be really, really helpful in this regard. And we want to talk as well a little bit about a scale. Now, what do I mean by using a scale to think about the relationships between elements on a page? There's a great article which I highly commend to you. You can look it up. It is on a listapart.com. And it was specifically talking about web typography, but the, the ideas are applicable everywhere. Historically, designers of all sorts, but especially print sorts, have used the idea of a scale which gives you relationships between sizes. If you've ever been to a page where you can tell that they kind of cared about typography because they, they used some non-standard fonts and they were clearly trying, but everything just feels slightly off, a lot of times that's because the different sizes that they're using and the spacing between them is sort of haphazard. Instead of saying, let's find a harmonious set of relationships, you know, historically that's included the golden mean. You can go to modularscale.com and create your own using the golden mean, using standard ratios. You can create your own ratio, but recommended musical ratios. These things let you use spacing in a way that doesn't actually distract from the flow of the text because you don't have random seeming spacing. You have spacing that fits in harmonious patterns with each other and with the size of the text. I'm not going to spend a long time on that, but I do encourage you to look up that article, Don't Compose Without a Scale, because I think it's very, very helpful. And look at modularscale.com if you want a tool that generates a scale for you. What about color? I said this is kind of in its own category here, and that might surprise you because color is striking and notable. When you change the color of something, it grabs your attention. But not everyone can see color, and not everyone can see the same colors that you can see. Secondly, color can sometimes be a way of cheating. You can use it to sidestep the process of doing all those other things we've talked about to establish hierarchy and rhythm. So a good rule of thumb is design it in grayscale, and if it works in grayscale, it'll work in color. What that gives you is two things. One, it makes sure that all those other design elements are already in place, and you're already getting natural rhythm and flow, and everything else is working the way it should be, so that color makes it pop. It emphasizes the existing hier hierarchy. But the other thing it gives you, and this is important and it's easily overlooked for those of us who have really good vision or otherwise are just used to thinking in those terms, it means that someone who's colorblind isn't inhibited when they're using your application. They're not suffering from those same things. The idea of accessibility as an enhancement, I think, is backwards. We want to make sure that our applications and our tooling and our Bibles are things that are as accessible as we can make them from the start building in those assumptions from the get-go. And gladly, at least in terms of text layout, of employing those other principles of good design and bringing in color last means you'll get there. And color can be something that's a nice touch for those who can see it, rather than something that breaks the experience for those who don't have it. Now, about the thing that probably most of us think about when we talk about typography. Typefaces, fonts, colloquially. Snobs like me will say typefaces, but colloquially, font is just what we say now. Technically speaking, if you're curious, a font is a specific size, weight, and style of a typeface. A typeface is the shape of the characters and a family of characters that go together for representing text. So now you know. It's okay if you use font. I won't feel like punching you for that. Uh, it is, again, the most obvious aspect of typesetting. And a good choice will make your app or your website or whatever stand out. It'll, maybe not in a conscious way, but people will like it. It, ev it evokes a fairly visceral reaction in us that maybe we don't consciously articulate, but choosing well makes people happy. Choosing badly makes people grumpy. And again, they may not be able to consciously articulate it. And if you choose just sort of the mediocre middle of the road option, if you use Times New Roman or Georgia, those aren't bad fonts. But no one's going to come away with that just sense of, to borrow an overused word, and thank you, Apple, for overusing it so much, delight. Sorry, that just, <laughs> I like that word. And now every time you say it, people think of Apple because everything's delightful with Apple. Um, 
But but you want people to come away, especially with a text that we all care about so much as the Bible, with a delightful experience, with a, an experience of joy in reading it, even if they're not aware that it comes from the typeface. So what are our goals in choosing a typeface? Well, I would say there are two. One, readability and context, and two, suitability to the text. These go back to things I mentioned at the very beginning. Readability and context. What's readable in one context is not readable in another. To give you a few examples. In a newspaper, you are trying to pack that text as densely as possible into the page as possible, especially when we're talking about print, new, print newspapers rather than NewYorkTimes.com, where you have an infinite canvas again, which is why Times and Times New Roman, which is derived from it, are designed the way they are. They're designed to pack a ton of text onto the page. They work great for newspapers. For your laptop, or especially for print that's not for a newspaper, they don't work very well. On the other hand, you have a smartphone, which is a very different context, and especially older smartphones with non-quote-unquote retina screens, you want something that, like for older computer monitors, is optimized to take account the low resolution. You can't do things with that kind of resolution that you can do with really high-resolution printers or with really high-resolution screens, which is why Printing things to a book in Georgia, like one of the Greek texts I used in seminary, looks terrible because it's a, it's a typeface that wasn't designed for books. It was designed for the constraints and limitations of a laptop, and it did really well for that. That's why every second website for the last five years has used Georgia, because it does really well on a wide variety of screens. It doesn't do so well for a book because it wasn't designed for that. And a reference book needs to use different kinds of text than a regular book, which is why some of our Bibles have not done so well because they've been treated, for readability at least, they've been treated more as reference text setting rather than reading text setting. And there are reasons and times where that's appropriate. Study Bibles, it can be really helpful. But your reading Bible, not so much. Now, what about suitability to the text? This is related, but it's not identical. The typeface that you use in a resume it's probably going to be different than the typeface you use for your Bible because they're presenting different kinds of text. If you've got a soap advertisement on a billboard, well, it's probably okay to use big, thick, bold fonts with that are highly stylized. If you use that for your coding typeface, it's going to be completely unusable. And so you need to be aware of the context and the, the content and try to present with a typeface that is suitable to that. So instead of saying, well, I really like Zapfino, which is a very decorative font and is great for certain kinds of, say, invitations, so I'm going to use that to typeset my Bible. Maybe not. Maybe you should use a typeface that is appropriate to the context, that is appropriate to the content. So what kinds of faces are there? I'm just going to move through these pretty quickly. You can spend a lot of time reading about them. I recommend the site I love, typography.com. And I'll confess to being such a nerd that I have, in fact, said out loud, I love typography, while reading down through ilovetypography.com. My wife was amused. Two basic big categories of typeface here, sans and serif. And you can actually see them right here. A sans is a shorthand way of saying a sans serif, which is like the, the main body text here. There are no hooks or horns on it. They're very clean. They tend to give a fairly modernist feel. The serif is like what all the headings are. It does have those hooks and edges on it. And those actually tend to be very, very good for long form reading, though the one I've chosen here is not so much. It can be, but you have to work with it quite a bit. It's actually what's called a slab serif. This hints at something. There are a lot of varieties within all of these big categories. Again, I love typography.com is going to be your friend. You have proportional versus monospace. If any of you sets a Bible in a monospace, I'm going to feel not quite as angry, but close as if you do it in Comic Sans. Monospace fonts are great for things like writing plays or writing code or things like that. They're not as good for reading a Bible. And the difference is that unlike these fonts where an I is much narrower than an O, a monospace font, every character has the same width. And that's useful in some contexts. It's not great for reading. So please don't. Please don't set anything in Courier uh, for, the, for your Bible. Please, please. Uh, and then you have kinds of categories within these. Body, display, and decorative. 
Uh, a body text is going to be a style and weight of the text that is of a given font, given typeface, that's just designed for reading. A displayed version of a typeface is going to have the same basic shapes, but it's generally going to be a heavier weight. The characters are often going to be set closer together within it. And those things make it good for big headings and sometimes for display on billboards or things like that, but not so great for reading because the text tends to be more condensed and the strokes tend to be thicker. You want to look for a body style of that. And most gladly, most fonts you find, whether it's through a font house or even that come installed on your computer, are optimized for body text. So the place where you need to think about this primarily is in thinking about headings and things like that. Finally, you have decorative kinds of typefaces. Your cursive faces, your, I mean, honestly, Comic Sans and Papyrus are decorative typefaces. And they're not really that bad for what they're meant to be. The problem is that they've been used so much in contexts where they don't belong. Back to our issue of context. Use the right thing in the right place. And then you also have things I mentioned earlier that are really about the shape of the stroke. How tall is quote unquote X height, which is just the height of the lowercase letter to the uppercase letter? That makes a really big difference in the perception of the font. How wide are the characters and how consistently wide are the characters? Going back to our example with Dido and uh, Century Gothic earlier, Century Gothic's characters are all, broadly speaking, wider, with basically the exceptions of the I and the L. Almost all of them are wide. There's a lot more variation in Dido about how wide they are, and Dido's characters are narrower in general. So those kinds of things make a really big difference in how the text reads. And why does this matter? Well, let me put it to you this way. Context matters for Bible type faces. We want them to be readable over stylish, so, so not our decorative typefaces. And we want to match the typeface to the content. But content includes translation. And here's where this all really comes home. If you have a translation like the KJV and you set it in Helvetica, it's just going to feel a little weird. Helvetica is a great typeface and the King James is a great translation, but those two don't go together. Helvetica is very modernist. It's, it doesn't convey the sense of weight. The King James conveys a sense of, it, it, it deserves a sense of weight and age to complement the feel of the text relative to us. On the other hand, the text I set holybible.com in would look weird on the New Living Translation because the New Living Translation is designed to be much more modern, much more readable. NLT might look really good in a Century Gothic or a Proxima Nova, which is what I've used as the sans complement on holybible.com. So thinking about even translation as a kind of context, it again helps make sure that the content is supported by the form. So big takeaways. Focus on readability. It really does matter if you can just pick it up and read. And the tools that we have for that are layout. You have the relationship between the typeface, you have the line length and height, and you have the interplay between them. And you want to make sure the reader can just flow and doesn't get stopped by any of those things. We have hierarchy and rhythm. Weight, style, ornamentation, white space. Difference draws attention. Take advantage of that. And remember to use a scale so that your white space doesn't just look goofy. Finally, typefaces. Learn to know what distinguishes them. If you're in the business of typesetting, know what, what makes a typeface work. And know what makes a typeface work in a context. Make one You want them to be readable in their context, and you want them to be suitable to the text they're displaying. Some resources. Again, these I highly recommend. A list apart. I love typography and modular scale. They all have very, very good information on this stuff. And that's, that's me. Thank you. Oh.